Well, I'm actually a North Carolinian. Um, there's an, an asterisk because I was raised in a military town. I'm from Fayetteville. And I moved up to Raleigh to go to college. So I started at Wake Tech, finished my associates out there, and then um, decided to go to Meredith College. I had actually looked around um, to NC State and UNC, and Meredith just had a great hands-on program for studio art. Um, and that's where I actually, I thought I was going to go into graphic design, thought I was going to be responsible and go into graphic design and, and maybe become a professor um, from there. Um, but fell in love with just studio art and decided to keep my day job as is and keep the art just in pure form um, where there's like no um, interjection or, you know, drifting to something else because it, it's what pays the bills and things like that. So I can stay in my conceptual art. <laughs> um, Meredith really, they, art has such a research component behind it uh, once you get into the upper level co courses. And so what I got into was the nerdy side of it. So I would do a bunch of research and then that would be what fed my art. Uh, so the psychology associates, my associates um, that I got at Wake Tech was in psychology, I intermingled with the art. So once I started doing research, I would research things that are conditions of the mind that affect the body physically, so I could incorporate that into figure art. So, uh, well, I really felt like art can create an empathetic viewing for people, where you can look at it and you can feel what people are going through. And so when I started developing this, I would have a teacher challenge me and say, well, what, what's in the room? What objects would tell the story as well? Uh, so for example, I did a whole series on depersonalization. Uh, there's a whole out of body experience where people feel like they're outside looking in. Um, they also feel a little disconnected, disjointed. So I put a staticky TV screen in the room and make it so that it would mimic what the person is feeling. Um, and then I would do overlaying figures on themselves to mimic what it would look like if somebody was, you know, having an out-of-body experience and um, what it might look like. I really feel like there's such a, it's so taboo to talk about mental health or ha struggling with it. And really, it's very common. Um, so what I wanted to do was basically make it a safe space and show that other people are going through it as well. Um, I really feel like people react to our environment. It's not necessarily you personally going through um, something in your mind and it's all your fault. It's more so that there, this world is a little tough to be in sometimes and we respond to it. Um, and there's ways that the brain will protect you from the pain that you're feeling and things like that. Uh, so I wanted to bring that to the forefront so that people felt more comfortable to talk about their, their issues and maybe felt like if it wasn't all them, if it wasn't personal, if it wasn't um, all their fault, that they would feel more comfortable to talk to somebody else and maybe get help, get counseling, um, and maybe get some of that pain out so that it wouldn't be so torturous. I actually research a lot. And when I, the more I read about it, the more visuals I see, the more um, I can imagine the person in the space or what it might be like for them. Um, and then I start, um, I take photographs of the model. Um, we, we joke about my muses, but uh, <laughs> then I go with the photographs and actually let the photographs decide the composition because when I take, when I do photography, I don't like to, to overly guide or tell people exactly how to sit. Um, I like to let them have their natural, where, where they would naturally sit and how they would naturally be in a room. And then I take those images, and I, I used to do the thumbnails, but overlaying figures is not fun to do thumbnails with. So that didn't work out, and I started doing Photoshop. And I would take the images and actually overlay them in Photoshop to see what it, the composition would look like there. And I also look up television screens. Um, originally, I had done the entire room, and the TV would be in the background. Then I started incorporating the screen with the person. Uh, so once I did that, I was like, I have to go full throttle. And I made the TV screen more forefront. Um, not many people pick up on it. I know I'm dating myself for the snowy, out of focus TV screen that we used to have as 80s kids. But, um, and, and I let that composition tell me where, you know, like I see it on the screen and I see where I want everything to lay before I go to the canvas.
Um, and then started with canvas, I actually do glazing, uh, which is a technique where you actually thin the oil paint down. Um, so you thin it down um, with oil, a little bit of thinner, and um, some varnish. And I do clear lay or thin layers overlapping itself. So I originally just paint the uh, figure in a, in a monotone just to create value and, and um, make it more three-dimensional. Then I put the color over on top. It, it's tough to get the gears flowing. And so it's almost good to do a side project um, where you're not necessarily working on that concept that you've been working on for years and, and just pick up a and play again where we get so professional in our mediums, it almost stops to become um, meditative. It, you have to go back to that again and just do a, a, a doodle or something that uh, doesn't have to be perfect at the end, that you don't worry about the end result. Uh, it was also a reason why I enjoyed doing what I called the tag wall at Art Space, where it was just like I let people come in and just freeform, do, draw whatever they want, anything, just to get those gears flowing so that you, you play with the materials and you have fun again. I'm actually thinking about switching mediums entirely um, and playing more with changing the base, making it half sculpture, half painting, where what I'm painting on can tell the story as well as what I'm painting in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really just when you go out and you see some of the beautiful art that's done, I would say that's the biggest catapult for me uh -huh. is, is just seeing other work that's incredibly done and you have, you have to be like okay I have to learn how to do that. YouTube is a big selling point as well. I love to go on YouTube and just see what other people are working on. Um, that's a great resource. I wish I wish I had it when I was young because I would have definitely I was so scared to use the materials incorrectly which is don't worry about that you know like if it's if it doesn't turn out good throw it away you know but I was very concerned all the time uh, but YouTube is a great resource I also think workshops are a great resource um, going and have another artist challenge you in, in the technique and say I don't do it that way I do it a completely other way and it'll turn you on your head and, and next thing you know you have a, a breakthrough or something a new style comes out of it definitely learn to listen with one ear um, you will get a lot of opinions a lot of takes it's so subjective and it took me when I first started, it was I got a bunch of opinions all at once and I was taking them all to heart. I wanted to do all of it um, and, and take, you know, like I needed to challenge myself in color. I didn't use color enough. And then I'd have another more experienced artist come up and go, that's just you. Who cares? And, and the, when I had an experienced artist to say, you remember the whole point of this is so that your voice is there. I had to realize that I need to listen with one ear. Like I can take advice and I can say, okay, maybe I can throw a little more color or, or challenge myself in that. But then at the same time, you have to remember it's, it's yours. And if you like some muted colors, go with your muted colors, you know? Like it, the whole point of it is to have your own voice. So definitely learn to listen with one ear. Um, with starting a charcoal drawing, especially one thing that you have to think about is where your hand will be placed. Um, because once you start, if you if, say if you start on this side and you're right-handed, you'll eventually smear what you drew if you come over to the left side. Uh, so a lot of times with the, when you start a drawing, you want to start in the, in the bottom left corner if you're right-handed or the opposite if, if you're left. This way so that if you rest your hand on the paper, you don't have to worry about smearing what work you've already done. Uh, for Charcoal drawings, normally you don't have to map out where you're going to have things, but if you want to make sure that everything's going to be placed within the, within the frame, it's a good idea to start with a, uh, just like an HB pencil and just kind of do some light marks on where you would like to place things. So for example, I started here and put where I'm going to have the steps so that I know where everything's going to be. Um, when it comes to drying grass, it, it's an interesting object to start with. Uh, one of the reasons is it can be very freeing, but the other thing that you need to think about is where the white spaces will be. Um, with charcoal, you want to think of the value. You want to think about where your light spots will be and where your dark spots will be so that you don't darken it too much where you want your highlights. Uh, okay, so I chose this picture to do a, a drawing from because once you start to learn this one area and you learn how to make the grass and the wood, it repeats throughout the entire 
picture. So once I teach you how to do this small portion, you can continue to practice throughout the entire picture and make a complete piece. And so I was hoping at, at a form of a small demo that that would be the most helpful way to show you this. Instead of going a complete piece, start to finish, show you this portion so that you can finish it yourself. You do want to start with a 2B pencil. Now I'm just using a general pencil. Um, I'm not particular to any brand yet, but these try and true is what we begin to learn drawing on. And it, one thing about charcoal that I like is that you can go from being an intro level to being an expert and doing masterpieces that take a hundred hours to finish. Uh, so it's a good tool to start with because you can do a lot over time. Um, for sake of demo, normally I would start here, but for sake of demo, I'm gonna start over here just so that you can visually see it a lot easier. But when you're starting with these grass, you wanna think about what it is, and it has an, a base point, and then it sprouts out. And you can literally do this and let it overlap. And then come in. One thing that I learned about Thankful Tools Blending brushes, things like makeup brushes, they are a great tool to come in and use with charcoal. So when I, with, with my little sprouts that I'm starting here, the side pencil, I come in and I take a blending tool and I actually dab it. And just let the charcoal start to, to define where these blades of grass will be. actually starts to form itself and give you where highlights would be and where the darker points would be. And then there are smaller smudge brushes. You can even come in and start with literal blades. After I get a good value, I like to use these erasers that you can actually use half as a stress ball, half money into, into space or into a shape. And you can actually take these erasers and you can knead it into what shape you're trying to erase. And so I can come in and even make them blaze of grass. And I can start to define where I want these highlights at. Because the 2B, what's good about the 2B is that you can still erase it pretty well. You can come in, you can define where the highlights are gonna be and where your darkest points will be. And then actually when it starts to look like little blades of grass is when I would come in and bring in a little darker of a pencil and bring in the 4B. And I would start to bring out and not draw the literal line of it, but actually see where these spots were overlap and take in and just bring in little dark moments of where things would start to bring in more shade. So you can start to see where smaller blades would be. And I almost form squares or diamond shapes because if you look at the picture, you can't see all of the blades. So you only will need to draw the spaces in between. Good thing about using a kneaded eraser besides having it as a stress ball at the same time is that you can form it into different shapes and you can make it tiny and form these blades of, gra of grass and just do overlapping and let it sprout out. Another eraser that is great for not only doing grass but also like say hair uh, this itty bitty little point, it's like a 0.05 mini eraser. And so you can come in and you can literally do straight lines of erasing out where you want the blades of grass to be. And you're gonna wanna keep the paper white where you want the highlights to be as much as possible. That's the biggest challenge with charcoal is how to get it dark in the, in the right places and keep it light in the places that have the highlight. So coming in with the 4B pencil where it gets a little bit darker, instead of doing full blades, I would just pull out these little square shapes 
of the in-between of where the blades of grass would be. The good thing about drawing nature is that there's no real rhyme or reason. Things are going to grow in different shapes as you go down. So you don't have to worry about exactly where things would be. You can let them organically fall. Now that I have some good values here, before I go into the darkest and the lightest, which would be the 6B and even getting into the white pencil, before I go into that phase, I am going to start the wooden step. Because wood is something that I think is beautiful to be drawn in charcoal, but it also, it looks more difficult than it actually is. So I actually wanted to show the phasing of that. So I did some draft marks here with the pencil of where I would like the step to be. So I'm going to bring, go back to my 2B, going to go back to the lightest phase, and I'm going to bring in a straight line of where the wooden step would be. And then the good thing about wood grain is that each step is going to be different, each wooden block is going to be different, so you don't have to worry about being too particular on here. You can just bring out where the wood grain would be, And then different lines. I use the side of the pencil along here. Main thing is gonna have some parallel lines in here. I'm gonna come back in with this blending brush. I'm gonna bring it across and I even bring it down. Because the thing about it is the values are not gonna be absolutely perfect even on a real piece of wood it's going to have different variants in it you know let it decide there on its own and then i come in with the needed eraser and i bring out some little highlights just to make sure i have them where i want the brightest points to be Then I'm going to come in with my 4B. I'm going to come over the lines that I already made. Just darken them a bit. Now one thing I didn't talk about was the prepping of the paper and taping the edge here. I do want to warn you that some tape might actually pull off the paper, like make it a little fuzzy after you pull it off. Um, one thing that you can do is when you're pulling the tape, you can actually dab your, your clothing with it before you tape it down on the edges of the paper. It makes it a little, the glue a little less um, potent or sticky so that it doesn't tear up the paper when you remove it. And a good thing about adding tape to the edges is it almost acts as um, you're creating a border around the picture, like it's, it's like a matted frame. So it can be like a shortcut to make it look like it has nice fine edges around, the, around it. And then I'm gonna come in with the 4B. And I'm gonna draw little squares and diamonds. Where the darkest point will be, and let my highlights stay instead of continually overlapping. Come in with the smaller smudge brush. I like to get in here with the small details and make it so that because it's the actual width of what the blades of grass would be, you can make it so that you can pull these little darker points out and not mess up where you want your highlights to be. You want to gradually darken, and so I'm going to go back, bring it back in that 2B, 
and I'm not going too dark yet and I'm making sure I like all my blades right where they are see where I want all my little sprouts to be at first you just feel like you're making a mess which is a legacy of charcoal it's an organized mess right And do a gradual back and forth as you get darker. You're going to smooth out your shading. Make sure you still have your highlights where you want them before you go in too dark. will actually have form and shape so you want to start forming the tips of where the blades of grass will be now that you're actually defining where they're going to be and the thing about it is these are so itty bitty you really just want to kind of make a V where the tips of the blades of grass will be. And there's so many overlapping. There's some shaded, matted underneath, like naturally as plants start to form. So as you do these Vs, don't you worry about the shading underneath, because with a plant, that's naturally how it's gonna be. You're gonna have some matted pieces underneath. As you have the defining blades in front. I actually went and ran around back when I was trying to learn photography and went through my old boring pictures because that's one thing that we also have to learn as artists is that we can't just pull a, a photograph from online that a photographer took and use it as our image because it, it's technically stealing. If you take their composition and you recreate it in any art form, it's technically stealing. So I wanted to teach good practice. So I went and found a, a photo of my own and it's in my mother's yard. <laughs> Uh, my mom has a beautiful yard and found these steps, these nice organic steps where they're not even all straight. So you don't have to worry about perfection as far as like um, all the wood has to be lining up. And, you know, like normally when you go to draw stairs, it's, it's horrific because it, it's of all the you got to get all the measurements precise and in particular. But with this, this one, you don't have to because you're not even drawing the entire step and they're not all straight. So I'm going to go in and the blades that I chose here in front and I'm going to define the edge of them with my 4B. I'm going to leave that shade there behind them to mimic the, the matted grass that's underneath. One good practice, especially when you're creating value, is to step away from it. Step back. Make sure that you like your value and you like things where they are, because sometimes we get so zoomed in and doing detail that we don't critique ourselves from far away. Um, I've learned that lesson. A painting teacher would come and just pull me back from it. <laughs> And so I'm going to complete one area here and, and let the less, let the rest stay as is, just to show how I reach the other side. So once you start coming in, the the ones that you want to use the least, if you're creating some nice values, you want to use the 2B and the 4B the most because that's going to be your nice mid tones, your your lower tones. But then when you come in, then with the stark contrast, you're going to bring in your 6B and you're going to bring in the white pencil that they have. I've even heard some people call the white pencil the eraser. And I'm just going to pull out where I want it the darkest in between here. And this is when I start to leave it. You can even shade off entire areas. 
if you pull back in a way, there's really some dark spots in here where it's just leaves some nice shadow marks. And so you can actually shade off entire areas to push back part of the plant that's seen less. And then I'm, now that I have my wood base, I want to come back in and use my 6B, right, especially right on that top. I want to definitely pick out the defining portion. Take my small smoke stick on that one and make it, I like to make it nice and smooth. You really want it shaded right behind where this plant is. Because the human eye can't see everything at once. So a lot of the things when you're changing your visual perspective, you want to push things and you want to make it seem like things are further back. The only way you can do that is by using value. And if you're working with color, of course, compliments. But you start to push back the little portions that, of course, we wouldn't all see every single blade here at once. I'm going to bring in just a little bit more detail with this and let it smooth out. And then the portions of grass that I definitely want to win is where I would bring in the white that I'm going to bring out here with my 4B. I'm going to really shade off some portions. Normally I like to keep my white separate from the charcoal, but with this, it's nice to have it nice and blended in to where it's sprouting from. use much white on the wood because I feel like wood it doesn't have the lightest value. Let's make sure all oh, this needs to be shaded in to push it back. And then what you want the stark white on top. trick for keeping a straight line is to keep your arm straight. That helps at all. Um, sometimes rulers come in handy. You can even bring a ruler into your drawing. For this one, it's not perfectly straight anyway because pieces of wood aren't that detailed and perfected. Yeah, it's like you're always working towards um, that final point where you can pull in that um, the darkest and the light where you can pull in the white and you can pull in um, your 6B. It's almost like that's where you get into the trust the process. You just have to know the end result, what you're working towards. And that you're not just, you know, making a mess for fun. Which that's okay too. Um, normally I would start with just the 2B and the 4B go all over. Um, you do want to kind of set a value scale when you start to do a charcoal drawing. So you want to define exactly how you dark you want your darkest points and how light you want your lightest point. So normally I would finish one corner just to set the tone. I guess that's possibly what exactly where that phrase comes from, but to set the tone <laughs> and to, to see exactly how you want your piece the darkest you want it. I tend to go pretty dark because I like to have some moodiness, some pop of contrast. But now that
that you have the light against the dark, you can see your little blades of grass a little bit better. You can take your white and you can bring it in. You can find. Exactly what portion you want to win and what you want push back. And it's basically a repeat all the way through. <laughs> 